Good morning. Uh, so today we're going to talk about why we need to use curvilinear features for EUV lithography. I'm going to start by asking a strange question. Is it okay to be using Manhattan features for in inverse lithography? Um, it should be okay based upon how the industry is behaving. But if you think about ILT, it's really natively done in the curvilinear space. And the only reason we're even talking about using Manhattan features for them is because it's the standard because we couldn't make the mask historically in the first place. So the industry, I think, has convinced itself that the Manhattan I ILT will get you close enough to the ideal solution. Um, and in fact, if you do things in the wafer space, if you do simulations in the wafer space, um, the simulations, in fact, show that's the right answer. However, just recently we've done a set of studies first on immersion lithography and, and showed that if you take a look, if you take into account the mask variability in addition to the wafer variability, you'll find that you incur about a 40% penalty in the overall process window by staying with Manhattanized features. But that's actually not the end of the story. That's not the end of the reason why we'd want to use curvilinear features for EUV. Um, in fact, there was a very good paper given at EMLC two years ago um, by uh, Kevin Lucas, who showed many, many different test cases. Um, this, is, this is just one of them, that EUV actually required curvilinear shapes. And there's a lot of good work there. I'll just sort of summarize it with, with, with essentially one result, you know, basically showing that you get about a 30 to 50 percent wafer plane process window enhancement by going to curvilinear features as well. Um, so the, 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 the point of this paper, the point of this talk, is to really combine these two studies. It's to combine the mask variability with the need to have wafer plane EUV curvilinear shapes and basically we'll show this data, which we'll get to at the end of the slide, showing about a 75% improvement, a really compelling reason um, to move the industry towards curvilinear shapes for EUV. Until I get there, we'll go ahead and, and, and you know, talk really about three things in this, in, in this, in this discussion. Um, we'll review why we actually have to use Manhattanized features, at least historically, and why that's actually not true today. Um, then we'll talk about why EUV is different than immersion lithography, and in particular, we cannot make the curvilinear and Manhattan shapes to be consistent um, for EUV lithography. And then finally, we'll talk about the mass variability. Um, we'll talk about me for a little bit, and then we'll introduce the, the, the Monte Carlo studies to show you where we get the 75% process window improvement. Uh, so with that being said, we'll go ahead and talk about the first part of the talk. Why is it necessary to even discuss about Manhattan ILT uh, today? Uh, to do that, we'll introduce a very simple system. It's a 20 nanometer contact and about 50 pitch, 45 pitch, depending upon which direction you're looking at. It's a staggered array. This is going to look something very similar to any sort of a contact or VL layer that you would want to do um, with a UV. Uh, you can read the source description on the right. Um, but the important thing is we're doing a purely optical simulation only. Um, we're not taking into account resist effects, although they're significant for EUV, they're probably less significant than they would be uh, for immersion lithography. Um, but importantly, we're also not taking into account wafer stochastic effects. Um, that may be a problem with, with some folks in the audience, but I'm making the assumption that getting the best optical system, regardless of, of, of stochastics, is going to be a necessary and sufficient condition in order to find the best um, um, optical system. Um, in essence, it's not that important. The, in, the intent of this is to give sort of a, sort of a toy system to show the effects that, that I want to talk about um, today. Um, if you actually look at the correction, the, the optimal or a close to optimal correction for this situation, um, it is a set of shifted ovals, which may not be what you would have predicted, um, but is actual reality. Um, I actually, since this is a simple system, we could manually optimize these curvilinear shapes um, to create the, the features that we want. And again, the goal of this is just to set up a set of masks so I can get mass stochastics, so I can demonstrate why the mass variability is, is, is very important. Well, if we're trying to print these oval shapes, um, historically um, in the variable shaped beam, electron beam systems, um, what you had to do in order to print any shape is to break it apart into rectangles. Well, well, an oval doesn't look like a rectangle, so you need to break it apart into many, many small rectangles, and you have a lot of them. Um, this is, process is called fracturing, um, and it turns out that the time it takes to make a mask is basically directly proportional to the number of rectangles or shots 
uh, that you have to break apart the pattern into. Um, each individual shot is written one at a time, um, therefore a lot of shots means a lot of write time. Um, for practical reasons, you pretty much have about a 24-hour limit on the, on the write time, otherwise you get defects, start beginning to get defects in the mask writing process, the resist, and things like this. Um, but from a practical perspective, or from a CapEx perspective, um, most mask shops are really trying to keep to about a 10-hour limit. Um, but regardless of the limit you choose, um, the large number of rectangles, um, admittedly large number of rectangles for this particular fracture, is, is too large to be done um, in, in, in high volume production. Um, so you lurk to turn to Manhattanize this in order to actually practically make the mask, which is what historically has been done for inverse lithography. Um, in the case of these ovals, that would turn into a single rectangle, which can be done in exactly one shot. Um, and that shot you can see again on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, for immersion lithography, the thought is that this would give you the equivalent process window. Um, and certainly from, a, from an optical simulation perspective, that, that is what you would get. Um, maybe a little bit worse of a process window, but you trade off with a much, much better, much more high quality mask, and the overall, the overall um, um, process then is, is the much better. So you're trading off ILT runtime, basically, um, for mask yield. Well, this actual study was done maybe 10 years ago, um, and it was presented at PMJ by uh, BG Kim from Samsung, um, along with Leo Pang, who at that time was with Luminescent. And they actually looked at a bunch of masks from ideal ILT, with um, less and le more and more um, sort of restrictions on the mask until you got down to something that looked like OPC um, on the bottom part of the graph. And, and they showed that the process window was basically a, you know, a, a, a monotonic function of mask complexity. The more complex your mask, the more the mask looked like the ideal mask shape, the better your process window was. And so people would typically settle on something like the second or third row where you had a trade-off, basically, the least amount of trade-off with, with, with focus window, and a, 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 a capable right time. Well, that study was actually missing something, and it actually turns out you don't actually need to do the fracturing that I showed a couple slides ago. You could actually create the curvilinear ovals in a much, much less number of shots, in this case four, if you were able to do some model-based mass data preparation and do some overlapping shots and then things like this. So you actually can recover a lot of the mass complexity while doing, at the same time, model-based mass data preparation, as well as some MPC as well, um, so you can actually ha make these four rectangles print the desired oval that you'd like. For EUV, this actually becomes important, because if I go to do the Manhattanization, I can still do it in one shot, but now I've got a corner rounding problem, right? So quite unlike the case, um, almost ironically, with curvilinear features where I can print the target that I want, if I'm trying to print a rectilinear feature, I'm always going to have area loss. As we know, area loss is going to, sh is going to be a problem with, with, with print biases, and we'll see this later on in the talk. Um, so it may be the case, actually, that for EUV MPC, you actually will bias yourself or prefer to use curvilinear features because they won't have a DC area offset um, component. But none of that matters. And the reason it doesn't matter is because two or three years ago, um, New eBeam Writer tools have, have really come online and are, are, are in various mesh shops today. Um, and these eBeam tools don't write one rectangle at a time. What they will do is they will essentially rasterize a bitmap of your pattern into a grayscale image, almost like a continuous tone mask for, 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 for ILT. And they will use these grayscale pixels to be written by one of many hundreds of thousands of individual beamlets. And so the mask writing time really isn't determined by the number of shots you have, it's determined only by the area of the mask that you write. So no longer are we constrained by simple versus complex features because the write time for that are the same. And so if you can write using this new tool, there's no reason to go Manhattan and we should be looking at whether curvilinear, a change to do curvilinear shapes would be beneficial for it today. Um, that being said, um, MPC is still required for these features, just like it would be for a VSP tool. Um, and the kind of MPC you would choose to do would be a little bit different for curvilinear than it would be for rectilinear. Um, so I'll leave you with the first half of the talk, talking about my first message, 
Really, it's a curvilinear shapes can be done today. It's compatible with the processes. Um, probably the thing that's missing is the, d is the need to create new mass grill checks to make sure that we can reliably manufacture these things. But I think that's a detail um, that the industry can, can move towards fairly quickly and will actually be a subject of a future, future study of, of ours. Um, the second message is that EUV MPC, I'm going to assert this, really is only practical to do for curvilinear features. Right? Corollary of this, it turns out that we need to take, we need some help from OPC to make MRC aware OPC shapes uh, to really make this view happen. Um, and again, I'm asserting this for now. Um, it is rather a strong assertion and it will again be a subject of the future, future talk um, um, from myself. Okay, so let's go to the second half of the talk and talk about why it is that we can't use Manhattanized ILT and, and curvilinear ILT for EUV lithography. Right? They're not going to be equivalent. Um, and to show why they're not equivalent, I want to actually go back to a previous, the previous study that we did that showed why they were equivalent for immersion lithography. And, and then this is sort of the key result. I have, I'm showing you three masks here. A, a purely curvilinear mask on the left, a, a curvilinear assist feature in the middle, and a purely Manhattanized ILT mask on the right. And on the bottom is, 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 the, is the 30 nanometer, uh, plus or minus 30 nanometer focus windows. You can see they all look the same. In fact, probably in your screen, it's probably very difficult to tell that these three masks are actually different, and that's actually on purpose. But looking to see if the mask is different actually doesn't tell you anything. What you really want to look at is something called a band-limited mask. And what the band-limited mask is, is the spatial frequencies that are contained in the mask that are actually collected by the optical system. Then all you have to do is transform that back to the real space, and you can plot, in this case, the magnitude of the band-limited mask. And in fact, this actually is the continuous tone mask the ILT will attempt to optimize for. And what you can see with the three band-limited masks is they also look very similar. And in fact, that's the reason why you get the same through-focus behavior, you get the same optical behavior. It's not because the masks look, look fine in the real space, it's because the band-limited masks look the same in terms of magnitude and phase. Um, and in fact, it turns out there's an infinite number of these, of these masks I could create. Um, Vivek Singh from Intel is very, very, uh, likes to show random dot stereograms that will, will print contacts like this. Um, and that doesn't look like any of these masks, but it can't give you the same band limited mask. But it turns out there's a prescription, which is used in the ILT industry today, to create the same band limited mask. And what they do, is they ensure that the Manhattan mask has features in the same places as much as possible as a curvilinear mask. And then where they can't actually match them in space, what they try to do is they try to maintain the same area over a certain length scale, over the optical length scale. Um, for immersion lithography, that turns out to be about a 35 nanometer length scale. It's relatively easy to do. Um, the subject of this talk is going to be looking at 0.33 NA EUV, and that's about a 10 nanometer length scale. And if we're talking about a 20 nanometer contact, that can become a little bit problematic, as we'll see in the later slides. So I'm going to actually move to the Manhattan version of the EUV um, solution, if you like. So again, printing the same 20 nanometer, 20 nanometer contact target. I'm now going to use a set of shifted, elongated rectangles that actually print this target. And that's actually not intuitive. Um, immersion lithography would have these being squares that were centered. EUV is different, and, and, and while this isn't designed to be sort of an EUV uh, tutorial, um, it is important to understand where these things come from. And so one important difference in EUV lithography is the fact that the normal incidence on the, on, on the mask doesn't come in at zero degrees. It has to be shifted because it's a reflective mask. So in, Otherwise, it would rebound right back towards the source. Um, so that angle for 0.33 NA is somewhere on the order of 6 degrees. But when you actually take into account where the source actually is, it's anywhere between a range of maybe 4 and 8 degrees, maybe 3 and 9 degrees, something like this. Um, and that actually becomes, becomes important. Um, and th th there's a study a couple years ago done by ASML showing that the these, this, this, this angle, this angle dependence, um, you get actually an image imbalance in your source, and that image imbalance for a two-bar system anyway will actually make the two-bar system print asymmetrically. Um, for this particular case, it makes the contacts shift downward. 
um, just entirely due to, to reflectivity differences between 4 and 8 degrees. Um, that's not the only thing. The other thing, which is also critically important, is that there are stronger asymmetric uh, mass 3D effects. Right? So the absorber on the EUV film stack is is going to absorb differently depending upon whether the angle of incidence is x or y. The y direction has the six degree angle attached to it. It gets shadowed more by the absorber versus the x direction, which effectively comes at a zero degree um, angle with respect to the x axis, does not. And so that accounts for some of the elongation you see um, in, in, in this picture. Right? Again, this is not an EUV tutorial, it's very basic, but that's kind of the idea of the different things um, that you see in EUV, and those actually become important. Now, these rectangles, if you believe my simulation, will actually print to target. Again, this is a focus window band, where now the center focus is designed to print at the, at, on the on-target area. It's designed to print at the target shape where the, where the plus and minus focuses print smaller. Um, and you can see the width of the band tells you the width of the focus. Um, if I zoom in, oh, excuse me, before I do zoom in, I'll show you the band limited mask. And in fact, you can actually see that you get a higher intensity at the lower part of the rectangle, which causes the, the actual circle to move down. Now, if I zoom in to what the mask looks like, um, you can measure a 0.8 nanometer focus band, and it's actually pretty good. But the interesting thing about this is the circle, even though it prints 20 nanometers X and Y, is actually deformed. Um, and this is actually a, 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 a consequence of both of the image imbalance and the mass 3D effects that causes a rather distorted circle instead of a circle that you actually want. So what that tells you is that this, this very simple rectangle actually isn't the optimal solution. You need a much more complicated rectilinear solution in order to make this circle, well, in order to circle the circle, really. Um, but instead of doing that, we might as well go all the way to a curvilinear feature anyway. Um, you can see, again, the same style of correction, elongated and shifted. You see the band-limited mask, which is now, you know, now it looks circular, it looks different. Um, but importantly, when I zoom in to the contour, um, now these contours actually turn out to be, to be circular. Now, I will point out that I'm not making any approximations in this optical system. Um, I am actually doing a real uh, rigorous 3D EM calculation. Um, we're doing with a G highly GPU accelerated system um, where we can do uh, almost 2.7 by 2.7 micron array, um, four source points because I got four poles. I can do the computation in under 10 seconds, which is incredibly fast. Um, not fast enough for OPC, but it's fast enough to do a lot of really complicated studies. Um, and it's the benefit of having GPUs um, to do this. But just looking at the continuous tone masks, you'll see that there isn't that equivalence. There isn't the same continuous, I'm sorry, there isn't the same band limited mask between the oval and the rectangle. Now, some of this is because of the wavelength effect, but a lot of this is due to the Schieffer angle effect of six degrees as well as the master D effect. And so when you're doing ILT, you know, you, you really want when you move to the Manhattan shapes to have something that's similar because it will be at the same place of optimization in, 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 your, in your OPC optimizer. Now we have no guarantee that that's, that's the case. And in fact, you see that this actually becomes a distorted circle instead of a real circle. So I will say that these just aren't equivalent and shouldn't be used in, in concert with each other. You can contrast that with the 193i case again where you see very similar uh, band-limited masks. Okay? So again, even though there's an infinite number of solutions, for 193, we can put features in the same spot and we'll be okay. But for EUV, the, these extra things uh, really make it hard to do that. And, and basically this idea of just area matching doesn't, doesn't apply anymore. And so that leads me with my third message in that the complications of chiefer angle and mass 3D effects create problems and basically create in, in equivalences between the curvilinear and, and, and the rectilinear solution. Um, so what does that mean, right? If we need to use curvilinear solutions, or we should at least stay there, um, that means we actually need to make sure that our OPC tools have rigorous M3D all angle solvers or some amount of all angle solver uh, to, to, to approximate the rigorous, the rigorous answer. Otherwise, the master defects will be wrong and we're not going to get the right answer. Um, if we do that, though, there's an implication for that. Um, you know, there is a, a, a desire in the design community to move away from this concept of rectilinear masks, certainly at least zero and 90 degree masks. Um, and really the only thing that's keeping us there is the fact that our OPC engines um, are, 
rectilinear, or one of the things that's keeping us there anyway. Um, by making the OPC engines purely curvilinear, um, that is one step closer to the, the goal of having, there's no additional overhead anyway from OPC uh, to go to curvilinear design, and that's one barrier removed. All right, so now it's time for the third half of our talk, and I'm going to sort of leave this question up here as an exercise for the viewer, and hopefully you have your opinion on what this answer should be. I'm not going to tell you what it is, um, but I think you might know my opinion, and we'll, we'll just go ahead and go on to the third part. Um, so before that, we'll talk about mass curvability, and, and in a particular MEEF, um, and MEEF is kind of a strange concept, right? MEEF is the word OPC engineers or lithographers use to, to lump all mask errors together. But really there's two things to it. Really what lithographers talk about as MEEF typically is the EF, the error factor portion of MEEF. And that tells you how much your wafer contour will change as a function of changing the mask contour. And it usually completely ignores the fact that you may have a mask error portion of it. And it's the mask error that becomes the problem, and that's why we're doing this, this, this study today. But a mask making process is virtually identical to a wafer manufacturing process. One uses an E-beam, the mask, and one uses an optical or an, or, an, or an EUV lithography, a wafer. But other than that, the rest of the process is, is pretty much the same. And so all the kinds of process variabilities that exist on the wafer side will also exist on the mask side. And so we should attempt to really understand what they are. Um, well, it turns out that the mask has a print bias which is dominated by changes in dose, and we like to call that dose margin. Um, you can see the simulated image. Basically, the dose margin, which is equivalent to one over the ills or one over the nils, or whatever you like to whatever you like to use, um, that dose margin gets worse anytime you have a print bias. Anytime the printed edge is away from the 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 e beam edge. And what does this happen? It happens for small features. It happens either in the width or the space. It happens at corners. It happens at line ends. Uh, well, how much of a difference does it really make? Well, if you look to the right-hand side of the page, you can take two cut lines, basically a good one, which is across the middle of a long 1D feature, that's the green, or a bad one, which is along a line end, which is the red, just kind of a cartoon. Um, and you'll find that the variability um, looking at through dose variability basically is about a factor of two more um, on the line end that it is on the it is on the um, regular line, um, and that actually turns out to be a problem, right? It's actually kind of a cosmic joke because if you think about where are the hot spots on wafer, right? It, it's not in your 1D features, or I hope it's not. Um, typically, it's at these these highly constrained, highly curved 2D regions where you have really bad focus control. Um, it, it just prints very poorly. But this is exactly the place where you also have your highest mask variability, right? So we really want to see where does this mask variability get the worst and how do we minimize the effect of the mask variability. Now, we're not going to use me for this, right? Um, as, 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 as mask engineers, we, we know how to actually do this correctly, um, and that's to actually look at the, vari let's look at the dominant variability, which comes from the variability in, in, in the e-beam exposure itself. Um, We'll take each individual E-beam exposure, we'll vary the position by 0.2 nanometers, we'll vary the dose by 5 nanometers, and, and from that we'll get a distribution of sort of worst case mask contours. Um, this is strongly, the, the, the variability will be strongly dominated by the dose, but that's typically what's seen um, in, in the mask community. Um, we'll do hundreds of perturbations of this, from that we'll take the worst case masks that we get, from those worst case masks, we'll use those as simulations, as input simulations to get the worst case wafer, and for that we'll get the mask variability impact on the wafer variability. Um, we'll give an example of one epoch of this where it's, we've got a highly exaggerated dose variability, I'm sorry, uh, position variability on these shots. You can see the shots move. You can imagine in your mind how the doses will, will change as well. Um, so we'll go back to the rectilinear solution for ILT um, because that's something very simple to do. Um, we'll print that using a, a, a VSB tool and we'll find after these Monte Carlo simulations that you get a set of mask contours which fall into this red band here. So the sum, basically the XOR, if you like, of all the possible contours end up that look something like this. It's got a band of about 4.3 nanometers on the mask scale. Um, now that actually seems kind of large, but you need to realize that this is something like a six sigma error based on the number of simulations that we have done. And if you use that six sigma 
error, you can compute about of a 0.2 nanometer per percent dose margin. Uh, for those of you in the mask community, you'll find that's actually a pretty healthy process. All right, so we're not trying to use a bad mask process to look at the effect on wafer. This is actually pretty good. Um, in fact, I may be underestimating the amount of mass variability you will get, but, but that's okay for this particular purpose. So what does that do to the wafer process window? Right? So on the top, if you remember what the, just the simulation through focus simulation told you, it was about a 0.8 nanometer variance in focus. When I include the mass variability, that focus window now jumps all the way up to 4.6 nanometers. Now this again is on wafer. And since it's a 20 nanometer contact, that tells me when I have mass variability, I can lose up to about 50% of the contact diameter. Um, basically almost all of it coming from mass variability. And that, that's actually a lot, right? So what do we do to get rid of this? Well, let's print it with a multi-beam tool. Let's, let's try that. And, and you can see that show up now on the right-hand side of the screen. And just visually, you'll see that those process, the mask variability band, the mask process band, is quite a bit less. Um, if you then zoom in to see what that does on the wafer scale, you'll see the variability of 4.6 nanometers drops to about 1.6 nanometers, um, quite a bit less. Well, the, the reason for that actually is, is, is pretty, is, is, is simple if you think about it. Um, remember, we varied the, 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 the dose and position of every individual e-beam exposure. So for a, v, e, v, for a VSB tool, the entire contact is one exposure. So any error is going to shift the entire contact left or up or down all at once. Whereas if I print this with a multi-beam tool, I'm going to need tens to hundreds of pixels to all move in the same direction at the same time to get the same effect as having one shot move in the VSB. Right? So that's why the mass process variance is, is so smaller. The errors will just cancel out. Um, but there's one more thing to look at with this. Right? Um, look at the process bias. There is no contour on the, mat, on the wafer scale that actually prints to size. Right now, now, one might think that's because I need to do MPC, I need to size the rectangle bigger. Well, I did. Right? These rectangles have been sized to the right, to the right size. Right? And typically, how MPC will do it, they'll size the middle of the rectangle to be as big as you need it to be, and, and that's what you have. The problem is, of course, is with the corner rounding. Right? I can't get rid of that corner rounding, and that causes, again, an, an overall area loss, which causes an overall intensity loss, which is why there's a process bias here. If you try to maintain the same area by just growing the rectangle a little bit larger, then it turns out this concept of MIF gets in your way and actually you'll overshoot and you'll actually print the thing higher. So the MPC for this, this, this particular thing turns out to actually be non-intuitive and nearly impossible for a mass shop to do on its own without thinking about what the lithography impact of the MPC will be. Well, remember, I could actually print the curvilinear thing to size. So let's look at what happens if I print curvilinear features again with this multi-beam tool. Um, visually, the, the, the parcel spans look very similar, but the one on the left really actually is smaller. It comes down to about a 1.2 nanometer process variability, but also more importantly, there isn't a print bias. Because if you remember, I was able to print using MPC the complete shape for the curvilinear feature because I conspired to make the curvilinear feature mask rule check compliant which means I don't have any area loss, right? So that's actually pretty important. So if I combine that with some data that I didn't actually show you, you'll find that going from the process of record, which is the red bar, the Manhattan VSB ILT, which has a 4.6 nanometer distorted process window, you can bring that down to about a 1.2 nanometer process window by just going to curvilinear shapes and printing with a new mask tool. So that leaves me with my last metric of the day. The mass variability really is an important major contributor to the EV process variability. Um, not only is it important, it's about 75% reduction to the point where it's probably compelling to get this industry to move to go to curvilinear shapes. I realize it's too late for the initial implementation for the initial production runs of, of EUV, but as we go forward, the second round, I think it's time for the industry to think about what it will take to move to curvilinear shapes for EUV. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Good day.